uh, now I have the pleasure of inviting Professor Ashima Goel to talk about monetary policy and fiscal framework, the route to India 2030. Thank you, Gursharan, and distinguished panelists, Sameer Kocher, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to begin by thanking Sameer Kocher and the Escot Scotch Foundation for uh, creating this platform for discussion on issues, policy issues, development issues at all levels, uh, a frank, open discussion. So as we are poised to look at India re becoming a $10 trillion economy in 2030, it would need a real rate of growth of 7% per annum. And if we grow at 9%, then we would get 4 trillion more of GDP. Per capita incomes would rise so that India would be a high, classified as a higher middle income, upper middle income group. And typically in such a group, the volatility of growth is reduced. What we have seen over the past two decades is much higher growth, but very volatile growth. There are periods of high growth and periods when it has gone down. So strong macroeconomic fundamentals are which, which lead to, which imply low inflation and deficits, reduce risk and volatility. They also enable counter-cyclical macroeconomic policy, which is very important for achieving stable growth. The monetary and fiscal framework that we have built as part of our reforms incorporates rules. And what is interesting it is that it reverses the relationship between monetary and fiscal policies. Earlier before, um, you know, in the period before reforms and worldwide also before these rules were put in place in many countries, you tended to have uh, monetary accommodation of fiscal deficits and government spending. And we moved from that to independence, more independence of central banks and restraints on deficits. This is a, puts in, these rules put in a long-term view that sensitizes everyone to the consequences of short-run action. But as with all changes, the change is sometimes too extreme. You switch from one extreme to the other. And I'm going to argue that it can lead to suboptimal outcomes for a number of reasons. And this is especially so if it suppresses growth below potential especially for India when we are on a sort of higher catch-up growth path and its poor have an opportunity for a better life. The theoretical literature classifies macroeconomic policies into active or pass passive. Long-term government borrowings affect debt, while monetary policy affects the cost of government borrowing. Fiscal po policy is said to be passive in the literature when it adjusts taxes and expenditure to keep debt within sustainable limits. Active monetary policy responds more than one to one to any rise in inflation so that real r rates of interest remain positive. This is a switch from the earlier regime where we had active fiscal policy and passive monetary accommodation, typically through the inflation tax. Higher inflation is a form of tax on the public. And, the, and if monetary policy is active, the other must passively accommodate it in order to prevent instability. And the reverse also. Only one policy can be active, the other has to be passive. Determinate prices or, or low inflation also requires one of the po policies to be passive. Why has this change happened? One reason is that the world is getting more closely integrated with freer cross-border flows. These impose a restraint on government expenditure. They want to see conservative um, low debt because that 
creates potential risk. And moreover, in an open economy, fiscal stimulus from government expenditure leaks abroad. It tends to appreciate the real exchange through higher inflation. While monetary, uh, monetary stimulus um, depreciates the exchange rate and interest elasticity of consumption demand tends to rise in a liberalized economy. So India has moved to a, a monetary fiscal framework where we have FIT and FRBM. That is flexible inflation targeting for monetary policy and Fiscal Responsibility and Debt Management Act. Flexible inflation targeting, flexible inflation forecast targeting, which we have adopted, actually uh, does not look just at inflation. It uses multiple indicators, all the macroeconomic variables that affect inflation. But you move from a multiple, uh, we used to have a multiple uh, indicator regime, an omnibus list. You move to a focus on inflation as your communication vehicle. But a lot of flexibilities are built in, a range of information is used. And the, the framework of India's uh, fit Fit is there's a memorandum of understanding between the central bank and the finance the government. There's a monetary policy committee. There's a band for inflation, and if in three quarters inflation exceeds or falls below, that is also important, falls below the band, then the RBI has to give an explanation. Th there's also a question of which inflation are you targeting, because there are a number of measures of inflation. So what was selected was headline inflation. And you're supposed to tighten only, especially if you're using headline inflation as your indicator, you have to tighten only if there are second round effects. Because headline inflation includes commodity, oil or food, which the, the central bank can only affect inflation which is created by excess demand. So flexible inflation targeting becomes very important if headline inflation is your indicator. You need to accommodate supply shocks and since you have time and communication is very important. You want to anchor inflation expectations. So you have to communicate how these supply shocks are expected to play out. Then accommodating them need not, um, need not create higher inflation or lower inflation expectations. The FRBM Act on the fiscal side was enacted by Parliament in 2003. And it is also forward looking. There are a whole lot of documents that have to be provided, a, a, a medium term fiscal policy strategy and macroeconomics framework. And if targets are not met, there has to be a pro rata cut on all expenditures. Some problems with this are that capital expenditure is not protected, no escape clauses, no counter cyclicality built in, for example, through expenditure caps. There are no incentives for compliance such as a shift from cash to accrual-based accounts. And the problem is that the government can legislate itself out of commitments. After the global financial crisis in 2008, there was a 4% rise in fiscal deficits. So a new review committee uh, had been set up for this and the report was submitted in 2016. They have focused on a path of debt reduction and I suggested a fiscal council should be set up. The report is yet to be accepted. The problem is uh, that fiscal and monetary authorities have different objectives and therefore a lack of coordination is possible. And I'm going to argue that the economic structure, India's economic structure has implications for optimal coordination. What is this economic structure? We are in a position of labor transition where structural unemployment large population in agriculture and low productive employment becomes involuntary because you have what I call quality cycle, labor is migrating and moving towards different kinds of jobs. So you tend to have a low slope of aggregate supply. That is output can increase without creating inflation. But there are all kinds of inefficiencies and hidden transaction costs that push up this aggregate supply. And this is the sense in which India, Indian output is supply constrained. And this is different from saying that there's a vertical full potential output. And when you hit it, then you hit a supply bottleneck. 
output is demand determined. But if there is higher inflation, it means costs are rising and you need to constrain production. Shocks on the supply side accounts for a major part of inflation. There is a lot of evidence that the economic structure is such. In the recent period, uh, macroeconomic tightening in 08, in 2011, and 2013, you had inflation that remained high and sticky while growth fell in the following quarter. Since 2011, we're having an industrial slowdown where there's excess capacity in industry. Econometric estimations give the slope of aggregate supply 0.13. So reducing demand to control inflation is weak and counterproductive, and there's a high output sacrifice. More productive is to focus on cost push channels, reducing cost and reducing inflation expectations. Now the objective of the fiscal authority typically is to raise short-run growth and employment. But the irony is that it is more effective in reducing inflation. As we said, in an open economy, demand, fiscal demand stimulus leaks abroad. But uh, a lot of these supply-side uh, bottlenecks can be relieved by fiscal action. The monetary policy objective is low inflation. But the irony is that they, their instrument, the interest rate, has a greater effect on demand-led growth. And when an emerging economy is on a high growth catch-up path, typically the growth rate is greater than the real interest rate. So even if you're thinking like the new committee, FRBM committee, the objective is to reduce debt, then higher growth is the most effective way to reduce debt. But the FRBM committee has assumed that the real rate of interest will be greater than the growth. And so they have asked for sharp reductions in deficits along the path. But uh, this is not true, even in the recent low growth and high interest rate periods, always the growth rate in India has been higher than the real rate of interest. And given our demography and expected high rate of growth, it's not going to be true for another 10, 15 years possibly. So to, so to adopt that as your criterion when it's not true and not going to be true for a large number of years and to hurt the possibilities of high transitional rate of growth is not, is not very good policy. There is a need to maintain high growth for employment and for poverty reduction. So if this is the economic structure, then what is the optimal coordination between monetary and fiscal policies? This needs to work together to shift down this aggregate supply, that is reduce costs through the economy. It involves supply side reforms, such as improving governance, reducing congestion in cities, improving la functioning of land and labor markets. It also has implications for the composition of government expenditure, reduce distorting subsidies, improve infrastructure, in public delivery of public services. Given the global economy where after the GFC nations are trying to increase exports and the WTO is in problems, um, the focus to stimulate and that government expenditure leaks abroad through imports. The focus of government expenditure should be on non-tradables, because most of that demand would stay in the economy. And what are non-tradables? Infrastructure. So the government should focus on, on spending in infrastructure. What are the implications for monetary policy? Tightening should be mild. The communication must be very good to anchor wage price expectations. The, the exchange rate should be competitive, but there should not be too much depreciation because it would be inflationary. If there is evidence of productivity and supply-side cost improvements, monetary policy must be accommodative. Use whatever space there is during macroeconomic stabilization to stimulate output and growth. What is the history of the monetary and policy interaction in India? Pre-independence, the Reserve Bank was set up as a strong institution free of political influence. But that was the period of planning. And so precedents and procedures got established that reduced the autonomy of the Reserve Bank. For example, the Reserve Bank agreed to the government's January 1955 proposal for ad hoc treasury bills to help financing, fi to meet financing shortfalls. And as the manager of government debt, it sought to support the government borrowing program. 
But Indian central bankers were always, and the Indian political establishment was highly anti-inflation because it was very unpopular politically where you know, incomes are not indexed. So the Reserve Bank sought additional powers in the 50s over bank cash reserves this for the statutory liquidity ratio. All this took away a lot of bank resources to finance government expenditure, but kept money supply growth low. So it squeezed the private sector in order to finance plans where the spending was often very unproductive and gave very low returns. The additional problem was that in the 70s you had large oil shocks and these new instruments allowed a squeeze on money and credit in response to these supply shocks. So demand-led recession followed. User charges were not raised for many public services after these cost shocks. There was a fall in quality. Public borrowing began for consumption. The ability to fund much needed infrastructure was reduced. Liberalizing, so liberalizing reforms in the 90s wanted to switch from this uh, combination which was not working. Strengthen the autonomy of the Reserve Bank. Issues of government securities no longer devolved on the Reserve Bank. Now both monetary and fiscal policy were active which created instability and harmed growth. Monetary tightening to compensate for, fis there was monetary tightening to compensate for fiscal giveaways. In 2011, large transfers financed by high fiscal deficit raised demand for food where there were marketing bottlenecks and reduced industrial growth. There was also fear of rating agencies by this time because India had uh, opened to a large amount of foreign inflows. And this, uh, this led to a fiscal consolidation from 2011 because India had high twin deficits and macroeconomic vulnerabilities, fiscal as well as current account deficits. And in 2014, the new government was committed to reducing fiscal deficits. So we are seeing improvements in this period. Macroeconomic vulnerabilities have been reduced, but there is some overreaction. If you focus only on structural reforms in the long run, in the short run, you bear a large and irreversible output sacrifice. Growth has been 2% lower since 2011. This implies a $400 per capita loss. So the problem in this structure is that, um, that um, uh, each, each, agent, each, each authority is more effective in achieving the other's objectives. In economics, uh, or we, we, we call it the prisoner's dilemma, which results in sort of non-cooperative strategic action, where each, each is afraid the other is not going to do what is needed to meet its objective, and so it doesn't do what it could do to meet the other's objective. The RBI said, thinks that inflation is a very low priority to the government, for the government, so we have to be strict and enforce uh, uh, a demand squeeze to keep inflation low. And uh, the government would think that the Reserve Bank is going to be strict, so we have to find way, ways to spend more. So whoever plays a non-cooperative uh, strategic sort of uh, action when the gets, a, gets a higher immediate payoff, so both will do it, and the result is both are not cooperating and everyone is worse off. That is the trick in prisoner's dilemma. You do what you, what, things, what you think will maximize your returns, but you're not coordinating, cooperating with the other, then you're both going to be worse off in the long run. So I have a paper in which I show theoret theoretically that delegation, one of the, apart from rules, you can also have delegation to a top uh, you know, uh, governor or the finance minister. So delegation to a more conservative fi fiscal authority and less conservative macroeconomic or monetary authority can change the prisoner's dilemma to a coordination game where you both cooperate and you get higher payoffs for both which become self-enforcing. In the jargon, the equilibrium is subgame perfect. A rule such as an FRBM preventing fiscal population, populism is an alternative, but a simple rule, the problem with a simple rule, if it's strict inflation targeting or FRBM doesn't work, what you need is constrained discretion because you need some sort of flexibilities. And as I've said earlier, actually inflation targeting, uh, the rhetoric disguises the reality. It actually has considerable flexibility. 
It's a rule like only in enforcing forward-looking behavior and transparency, and it prevents the central bank from taking actions that have undesirable long-run consequences. And there's supposed to be discussion to educate the public about these long-term effects. But if it is implemented by a conservative central banker, what you're going to get is no flexibility and strict inflation targeting. So the need for a more conservative fiscal authority and less conservative monetary authority to correctly implement the discretion available. There's a quotation, I'm not getting it correctly, it goes something like the young only understand rules, while the old understand the need for discretion and flexibility. In behavioral economics also, this year the economics Nobel was given for, you know, you, you understand how psychology affects policy and outcomes. So just after the financial crisis, we had excessive macro stimulus and overheating, 4% fiscal deficit, interest rates were cut some 6%. And the economy responded, uh, growth shot up from 67 to 9%, 10%. And uh, people say that uh, these uh, policies don't work, but this, they work, they work, they were too, too strong and they worked too strongly. So there was a pendulum, a reaction. We can't have this kind of overheating. So the swing was to too much conservatism. And as we've seen that the changes in rules and the, the role of foreign uh, investors, foreign investors really increases the autonomy of the central bank. But ultimately, the central bank is an agency, is a prince, is is an agent for all us, all of us as voters. We are the principals, and therefore, the the government, which reflects the mandate of the people, has to has to be dominant. So, if the central bank overuses its autonomy, that autonomy will be has to be reduced. It has to be made more accountable to parliament. And if a Fiscal authority is too conservative, doesn't understand the discretion available for counter-cyclical use of government expenditure. Then there would be adverse movements in growth and in revenue, and it is likely to harm electoral prospects. So I'd like to conclude by saying that rules should be used intelligently and work with the strengths of a democracy, mitigate its weakness. For example, inflation Targeting can be less strict in India because there is inflation aversion anyway built in. Inflation targeting was introduced in the, best, in the West because it was thought that agencies have a tendency towards inflation bias in order to win elections. But in India, it doesn't win elections. And uh, especially since the economic structure is such that each acts more effectively on the other's objective, coordination is very important. More populism can raise costs and reduce growth. Imposition of too strict rules can lower potential growth and lead to a delay in elimination of poverty. So balance, flexibility, understanding of context, and constrained discretion intelligently implemented is required. Thank you.